Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, weekly uh, seminar at uh, the Institute of Astrophysics here in Crete. So today we have the pleasure to have our very own Valentina Missaglia. Um, so Valentina is originally from Italy. She studied uh, in, uh, uh, at the University of, uh, of Napoli, where she graduated in uh, 2018. And then in 2019, she moved to Torino, to the University of Torino uh, for, uh, for her PhD uh, under the super supervision of uh, Francesco Massaro. And uh, she obtained her uh, PhD degree last uh, December, December 2022. And uh, she finally moved here to join the SMILE group uh, to work with us in uh, last February, February 2023. We are very happy to have uh, her on board. And um, so thanks for, for giving us this uh, talk today. The floor is yours. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you, Carolina, for the nice introduction. You know me as part of the SMILE team, but today I will present to you part of the work that I've done during my PhD in Turin. In particular, I studied the radio loud AGN with the multi frequency data that, among other things, gave me the possibility also to study the environment in which these AGNs live. So this is uh, the outline of my talk. As in every AGN talk, I will briefly introduce the AGN phenomenon with a focus on the two classes of radio loud AGN that I studied, the radio galaxies and the radio loud quasar. And then I will present you the results uh, of my PhD on uh, sources unidentified from the third Cambridge catalog of radio sources, and then uh, a multi-wavelength study of single sources, 3C403.1 and 3C297. And then finally, I will wrap up and uh, give you some future perspective. In 1995, Urien Padovani proposed the unified model of radio loud AGN. Antonucci did the same for the radio quiet, but basically, we have the same uh, components. So we have at the center of the galaxy a uh, rotating supermassive black hole. Um, this supermassive black hole is active, means there is uh, actively accreting matter. This matter has the form of an accretion disk here that is geometrically thin, optically thick, and we are on subparsec scale. Then on top of the accretion disk, we have the hot X-ray corona. Then at one parsec from the supermassive black hole, we have the broadline region. This region is made of gas clouds that move very rapidly. <coughs> then we have the optically thick torus of gas and dust around 10 parsec from the supermassive black hole. Then far, we have the narrow line region, again, gas clouds, but they, they move uh, slower than the clouds in the broad line region. And then in the case of a radio loud AGN, we have a powerful jet that starts from the supermassive black hole. It can extend from kiloparsec to megaparsec scale. As in this uh, very well-known image of uh, AGN, you can see that um, according to the orientation of the AGN or the observing angle, we can classify the radio loud AGN in three big uh, classes, radio galaxy, radio loud quasars, and blazers. Blazers are a radio loud AGN in which the jet is pointing towards the observer. And I won't read this class in this, uh, in this talk. Active galactic nuclei are uh, multi-wavelength sources. This means that we can observe the different components at different wavelengths. This is a very well-known uh, composite image of a nearby galaxy, Centaurus A. At the center of this galaxy here, we have uh, an AGN. 
If we look at the galaxy at different wavelengths, we see, for example, in the X-ray, the X-ray emission from the jet here and the emission from the ICM, that is the hot plasma in which this galaxy is embedded. In the optical, we see the emission from the host. This galaxy is very nearby, so we can uh, distinguish all the um, elements of the host galaxy. In radio continuum, we see the synchrotron emission from the jets. And at 21 centimeter, we see the emission from the neutral hydrogen. So given that the AGN is a multi-wavelength source, this is the typical set of an AGN. Here, we have uh, an in enhancement in the radio emission. If we are dealing with uh, radio loud AGN, of course, then we have in the mid infrared, the emission from the dusty torus. Then we have in the optical UV, the accretion disk with the big blue bump. And then in the X-ray, we have the soft excess and the emission from the hot corona. And then in the hard X-ray, we have the reflection component from the torus or the accretion disk. So as I anticipated, um, I will present results on two classes of radio loud AGN. First class is the radio galaxy. Kellerman and collaborators in 1989 introduced the, the radio loudness parameter. There is the ratio between the flux in the radio at five gigahertz and the flux in the optical B band. If this ratio is bigger than 10, we are dealing with radio loud sources. Uh, radio, loud, uh, radio galaxies are uh, divided mainly in two classes, Fanar of Riley type one on the left, Fanar of Riley type two on the right. The classification is mainly morphological, even if there is a, a threshold in luminosity dividing these two classes. For FR1, what we see, we have the radio core and then the emission from the plumes. In this case, the luminosity is higher near the core and then decreases along the plume. For this reason, these sources are also called edge brightened. In the case of FR2, otherwise, again, we have the core, then we have the jet. The jet is embedded in the loops and the termination point of the jet is the hotspot, is where the jet interacts with the surrounding medium. These sources, for this reason, are called the uh, edge brightness. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can I ask you something? Yes. Oh, why five gigahertz and not six? I don't know. There is some. There is some the, this is an historical or... reason, I would say. This is how you define the radio loudness of a source. Okay. Sorry. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> so, radio loud quasars. We have again two classes of radio loud quasars, the core dominated and the lobe dominated. Again, this depends on the observing angle and also depends on the ratio of the flux between the uh, core emission and the extended emission. Uh, we know that quasar appears very luminous. In particular, quasar cores are more luminous in the radio than radio galaxies. Um, during this talk, I will use the word quasars to refer to radio loud quasar because historically QSOs are the radio quiet uh, quasars. So if I say quasars, I mean radio loud quasars. We know that the AGN can interact both with the galaxy that hosts the AGN, but also with the large scale environment. This is a, a typical example of how the radio loud AGN interacts with the surrounding medium. Again, this is a composite image of a galaxy cluster. Galaxy clusters are the most massive um, uh, gravitationally bound system in the universe. Here we have, this is the X-ray emission from the ICM, that is the hot plasma that permeates the potential well of the galaxy cluster. 
we have here the optical image where we see the single galaxies of the cluster. And here we have the synchrotron emitting jets. As you might see, where we have the radio jet in the X-ray, there are some cavities. This is why, this is because the radio um, creates bubble in the X-ray emission. And this is why the two interact. So uh, all the sources I will present today are from the third Cambridge catalog, 3C, that it's a, a very well studied uh, uh, catalog of uh, the most powerful radio sources uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. The catalog lists around 300 radio sources. The first version was uh, done at 100, 159 megahertz, and then the two revised version at 178 megahertz, uh, both cases with the threshold of uh, nine Jansky. Back in 2008, a Chandra snapshot survey of these sources started. So the idea was to observe all the sources from the 3C sample in the X-ray with the snapshot observation, like from six to 18 kiloseconds, depending on the redshift of the source, to see if it's possible to um, find X-ray counterpart to the radio features like coarse uh, jets or uh, hotspot. And 3C radio sources in the X-ray are the very first sources that I have reduced uh, in the X-ray. So even if in the last decades uh, we have learned a lot about AGN, there are still some open questions like, how do jets interact with the environment that hosts the radio loud AGN, the so-called feedback? I try to answer to this question uh, studying the 3C sources from the, in particular, the unidentified from the third Cambridge catalog that usually live in poorer system to see if there are any exception. Then 3C403.1 uh, is a giant radio galaxy. Again, I wanted to study how the environments of this giant radio galaxy appeared. And then uh, we know that the feedback works uh, in, um, in fossil group at low redshift, but I wanted to investigate how the feedback works at high redshift, a redshift higher than one. So now let's go to the um, 3C unidentified. So among the 300 sources in the third Cambridge catalog, 25 are optically unidentified. So in Spirad 1985, we see that there is no optical counterpart for these sources. 21 of these 25 have um, NBSS counterpart. Among these 21, nine were, uh, I mean, all of them were observed by SWIFT, but for nine out of 21, there was an X-ray counterpart detected by SWIFT. The reason for the lack of the optical counterpart might be or that we are looking at high redshift sources, or they are low redshift but highly absorbed, or we are dealing with optically faint uh, low excitation radio galaxy. So this is what I did. Um, I analyzed seven sources out of the nine that had uh, Chandra available observation. Then I digged into the VLA archive to find the observation of the sources in different configurations and different bands with respect to the information we already had with the uh, NBSS. Since the observations were pretty old, I have to manually calibrate uh, and imaging all the sources. Then I performed the X-ray radio astrometric registration. All the sources had an X-ray detection. So I did the photometry of the nuclei and the spectral analysis for the sources that had uh, around 400 counts in the X-ray. For two sources, I found extended emission 
and I did the X-ray spectral analysis. Then I looked for the counterparts, X-ray radio counterparts, and then I made a comparison with the sources in pan stars in the optical and wise in the infrared. So I won't I won't present all the sources for uh, all the sources, but some that I found interesting. So the first one is 3C158. On the left, we have in the background the optical image. The magenta contours are from the infrared counterpart. These contours in red and in cyan in this image are from the radio map at 8 gigahertz. On the right, we have the Chandra image, full band of the source that is muted, as you can see. So for this source, the radio core was, was detected in radio, optical, infrared, and X-ray. What we see in the radio map is that on the, on the northern jet, we have two knots and one hotspot. Regarding this counter jet, probably these two features uh, are from the same lobe because in another map with different uh, configuration and frequency, we have one emission encompassing these two features. There is X-ray extended uh, uh, elongated emission that is partially associated with the radio jets. Since we have the infrared counterparts, we use the code developed by Glovakian collaborators that uses the magnitude in the infrared to estimate the redshift and the probability um, of a source of being a quasar, a high excitation radio galaxy, or a low excitation radio galaxy. So from this code, we obtained the, the highest redshift for all the sample. And also, errors are pretty big. So this redshift is not very reliable. And for this source, uh, an optical follow-up campaign is required. Then for 3C390, again, we have the radio core detected in radio, optical, infrared, and X-ray. As the previous slide on the left, we have um, optical contours in infrared and radio, and here X-ray, full band, and radio. The radio contours are at 4.5 gigahertz. What we found is an int of an X-ray uh, emission connecting the core to this hotspot-like feature. But as you can see in the optical image, there is an optical source here. So we wanted to investigate if the X-ray emission was due to the radio uh, hotspot or to this uh, optical source here. So what we did, taking into account the distance of these two features here, uh, we see uh, we looked in a um, circle of uh, 80 arc second radius if we can find other sources like uh, at this distance. We found a p-chance less than 4%, so we can say that this one is a background source. So this um, X-ray emission here is uh, related to this um, radio feature here. That yes, produced by the radio feature, not by the optical source that we have in the same position. I saw the. Where is the core of the galaxy? It's here. This okay. is the core. the core, and we found this hotspot-like feature. This is produced by the core. No, it's a, from the jet is where the jet interacts with the surrounding medium. It yeah, creates- but, but the jet comes from the core. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Um, given that we had a lot uh, of uh, uh, X-ray counts in the core, we also performed the spectral analysis of the core and we got uh, an um, intrinsic absorption that is comparable with the galactic one. So, Last two sources, 3C409. For this uh, source, uh, we didn't find an optical counterpart, 
So here we have the infrared image with radio contours, and here again, X-ray with radio contours. This radio map was obtained merging two radio observation at 1.4 gigahertz with different configurations. So I calibrated separately the two sets and then merged them while I did the set calibration and the imaging. So as you, and there is no a clear position of the core as in the other cases. Uh, around the source, uh, I detected extended X-ray emission. This is a circle with a 0.5 arc venous <laughs> radius. Um, I did the, um, uh, extracted the, uh, the surface brightness profile of this uh, extended emission, finding that this emission extend up to 60 arc, arc second from the source. I did also the spectral analysis, but since these are um, snapshot observation, I didn't have enough counts to constrain the temperature of this uh, hot uh, gas. Uh, I did the spectral analysis of the nucleus and I found an intrinsic absorption around 10 to the 23 centimeter to the minus two. This might be an hint that the core is absorbed and this is why there is no detection of the optical counterpart. And finally, 3C454.2. Uh, Again, for this source, we don't have an optical counterpart, but we have the infrared counterpart here. This is the X-ray emission. The black and blue contours are from uh, radio observation at eight gigahertz. And in this case, we have a clear detection of the core, the two lobes and the hotspot. So we would classify this NFR2. Uh, again, there is uh, X-ray extended emission around this, uh, this source. Again, surface brightness profile. The two in interesting features are these two X-ray cavities that are here and here in orange. And you can, as you can see, there is a, a jump in the surface brightness profile. For this reason, we uh, also measure the uh, significance of this uh, X-ray cavity. This one is more uh, significant than this other. Again, we should uh, obtain uh, deeper Chandra observation to better study these two X-ray cavities. So just to summarize, six out of seven sources have uh, a clear detection of the core in the radio. All have a wise infrared counterpart. Only three of, uh, of all have uh, the counterpart detected in the optical. For the others for which I was able to do the spectral analysis of the, nuclei, of the nuclei, I found um 10 to the 23 centimeter to the minus two value of the intrinsic absorption. So maybe we are dealing with uh, highly absorbed, skewed AGN. All sources have an X-ray counterpart of the nuclei. Uh, for uh, two sources, uh, I found uh, uh, extended emission around the source. Extended emission is usually the hallmark of galaxy cluster. But again, we need more deep observation to uh, test this hypothesis. And uh, if you are curious about the other sources, you can have a look at this paper here. So now let's move to 3C403.1. This source, uh, as I anticipated, is a giant radio galaxy. It was part of a Muse uh, optical campaign. So there was this uh, archival Muse observation of the field. Uh, I found that this source is part of a small group of dwarf galaxies. Uh, for uh, five sources in the field, I was able to extract the, the redshift. Uh, and given that the environment is proportional to the um, velocity dispersion of the sources in the group, uh, here the environment is galaxies, gas, and dark matter. So from these values, I 
made an estimate of the mass of the environment, there is around 7.5, 10 to the 11 solar masses. Then there were uh, archival observation of this source uh, from the VLSSR, CLIM, and MBSS. So what I did, I wanted to investigate these sources at higher frequency. For this reason, I did an SRT, uh, Sardinia Radio Telescope follow-up in the K-band. K-band is between 18 and 19.2 gigahertz with the nominal uh, bandwidth uh, of uh, 18.6. So what I did, first I measured the flux density for all the source, the, the entire source uh, for the VLSS, GLIM and VSS, and the new observation with the values found from the literature. To fit this point, I use the continuous injection model. This model takes into account two different population of uh, electrons, uh, uh, making the hypothesis that, that this AGN is active. So what we expect, we expect a population of freshly ejected electrons that have a power law shape. And then all the electrons that have, have basically um, broken power law. Uh, from the fit, um, I obtain also the break frequency. This break frequency, if we could have uh, like um, a time evolution of this uh, spectral um, spectral shape, we would see that this frequency moves to lower frequency. This is why this frequency can be used as a clock to measure when the first population of electrons was injected in the loops. And from this uh, parameter here, I estimated the equipartition field for the source and the age. Then I did the, the same um, analysis for the core and the two loops. So the core is this one in red. In green, we have the southern lobe. And in blue, we have the northern lobe. Among the three, the steeper is the core. Why? So I fitted all these uh, points with the Jaffe Perola uh, model. This model takes into account only one population of electrons that uh, age radiatively. So they lose energy both for, uh, from ICCMB and from uh, the synchrotron emission. Why it's steeper? Because if we made the hypothesis that this uh, AGN is active, what happens is from the core, we have the ejection of the electrons. These electrons, uh, arri let's say, arrive in the loops. So in the core, we have the older electrons. And this is why the core is steeper. And this is also verified from the spectral index map that was done mixing the SRT new observation and the NBSS. <clears throat> what we see here, okay, so we have uh, 0.6. Here we have 1.4. What we see is that from the outer edge of the lobe, the spectral index become steeper. So here we have the older electrons and here we have the younger electrons. And these sources are uh, usually called the uh, spectral type two. Uh, using uh, again the NVSS, uh, I did the rotation measure for uh, the source and there is a high asymmetry in the rotation measure from the north lobe and south lobe. Um, using the Faraday software that was developed by Matteo Murgia, we were able to constrain the intracluster magnetic field at the center, making the uh, hypothesis that this source is at the center of the uh, intracluster magnetic field with this, um, with this um, uh, value. And this value confirmed the trend that is found in literature that uh, 
the central magnetic field is fainter for uh, galaxy clusters that are less dense. So this is the SRT total intensity image. To produce the image, I have subtracted from the background both the galaxy contribution, the receiver contribution, and the atmospheric contribution. And I found that this, in these two regions here, perpendicular to the radio axis, there is a decrease in the intensity. So what I did, I looked for uh, X-ray observation of this source. There was one as part of the uh, snapshot survey. So what I did, uh, first of all, there is uh, extended X-ray emission that is not associated with the radio structure. So probably its origin is thermal, is, is ICM. I did the spectral analysis in this region. That is exactly the region where I found the decrease in the intensity in the radio. Uh, I found the value of the temperature, the density from the normalization, and the mass of the gas. Why here I say contonization parameter? Because we wanted to investigate this decrease in uh, intensity. Probably, we are looking at the sunaya zeldovich effect. So we have electrons from the ICM that scatter the CMB photons. And so we have a decrease in the intensity. Uh, there is also a change in the temperature of the CMB that it's uh, related to the thermal tsunaya zeldovich spectrum. And this is why there is the comptonization parameter. So I measured the comptonization parameter both in radio and in the X-ray. I masked uh, all the region that could interfere in this uh, measurement. But I found uh, a tension between these two values, three order of magnitudes. So the most plausible explanation is that here, there is a pool of non-thermal ghost electrons. So all their electrons that have cooled, they still have the energy to scatter the CMB photons, but we are losing their contribution here. So, um, and also there is a P-band uh, BLA observation in the archive that I found that have like radio emission only in these two regions, not along the radio axis. So the idea would be to um, study the source at lower radio frequency, to see if we can um, cure this uh, tension in the two comptonization parameter. So this is a summary of the results. The, from the optical, I found that 3C is part of small uh, galaxy group. From radio, I did the spectral analysis uh, to measure the equipartition field, the age of the source. The, rotation measure that gave me the value of the magnetic fields in the ICM. I studied the possibility that in this source, we have the Sunaya Zeldovich effect, but there is tension. So the, the idea is that we are losing part of the contribution from these uh, ghost electrons. Last but not least, 3C297. This is a um, Chandra image of 3C297, that it's a, a radio lab quasar. This is from the snapshot, so it's a 12 kiloseconds, small observation. The, um, these are the VLA contours at 8.4 gigahertz. The yellow circle marks the position of the host galaxy, while the red cross marks the position of the radio core obtained from the spectral index map between 8.4 gigahertz and if I'm not wrong, something about four gigahertz. Uh, what's it interesting in this X-ray image is this emission here, this X-ray emission here, that we don't know the origin because it might be ICM or 
I see CMB from this jet here, this counter jet here. So we requested new Chandra observation for a total of uh, 212 kilosecond in order to, this is the new image, in order to investigate the nature of the extended emission. So in the literature, we found uh, um, optical information on this source. So in Spirand, it's a radio loud quasar with this redshift. Uh, in Chiaberge, uh, Chiaberge and collaborators show this image from uh, HST. And I don't know if you can see, but there are like two peaks of optical emission. Like it's there, we are looking at the double nucleus. Since they were investigating if radio loud AGN are produced by mergers, uh, I mean, this is in agreement with their idea that uh, radio loud AGN are produced by mergers. Also, Cotilla um, um, reported that there is a lack of an associated galaxy uh, cluster or group, and there is this uh, highly elongated source here, uh, reported by Hilbert, that again is a suggestive of a merger. So in the X-ray, what I did, I performed a spectral analysis of three regions, the nuclear region, this one here, where I had 100 T photons. Uh, I fitted the emission, taking into account that the emission is non-thermal because it's from the AGN. Then the hotspot with uh, around 300 photons. Uh, the emission, again, is non-thermal, but it could be either synchrotron, synchrotron self-compton, or ICCMB. And the extended emission here with uh, 160 photons could be either thermal, so from the ICM, or non-thermal, ICCMB from the, this counter jet here. These are the results of the X-ray spectral analysis. So for the extended emission, as I said, I use both the power law for the non-thermal component or the thermal um, APEC. I want to stress two things. First, Chandra is experiencing a loss in the effective area. So there is a lack in the soft response. We know that the extended emission mostly emits in the soft X-ray. So this is a problem because we are losing a lot of photons in the soft band. Also, uh, the extended X-ray emission uh, due to the ICM uh, is very common around uh, high redshift radio galaxies and quasar because a lot of power is injected in the medium from the loop. Uh, with my colleague, uh, Juan Pablo Madrid, we did a Gemini follow-up of this source. So this is the field of 3C297. This is 3297. Uh, this is the I-band pre-image. So um, they designed the mask. Um, uh, masked sources we were interested in. Uh, first, the proposal was submitted to Gemini South. But then because of pandemic, uh, Gemini is out closed. So we had to um, repropose. And finally, the source was observed with uh, Gemini North. This is the new spectra obtained for the source. We have an updated redshift 1.408. These are the lines we were able to identify. The corona lines neon five are um, um, indicates the presence of high ionization gas, while the O2 uh, the O2 is the feature that we were most interested in because to fit the profile, we had to use two Gaussian component. One of the two, this one, is blue shifted. So usually in uh, AGN, the O3 line is indicative of outflows. But in our case, O3 fell outside the spectral range of the, of, the, of the observation. So what we did, we digged into the literature and the O2 line with his asymmetry can be interpreted as a sign of an outflows more than an inflow. So what I did, I checked back the 
Chandra image, because if I have an outflow from the core, I should expect a disturbance in the X-ray yellow. So I measured uh, this uh, in these two regions here with the um, red dot here and here, the significance. Here, the significance is pretty high. So it's possible that from this region here, I have an outflow that is impacting the X-ray emission. Okay, so I measure the counts here. Then I try all around the source to see how many counts I should expect. It's a Poisson statistic that I convert to a Gaussian statistic. So from the field spectroscopy, we didn't find any source at the same redshift of our source. And also from the X-ray uh, analysis, we found that this source has a very luminous uh, hot gas halo. So we tried to come out with an explanation for this. Uh, maybe we are looking at the fossil system. Fossil systems are group or cluster size objects that are formed hierarchically at a very early epoch. Uh, observationally, we should uh, uh, observe a magnitude gap higher than two mag in the R band between the two brightest galaxies. Uh, numerical simulation have shown that at um, uh, redshift higher than one, this uh, fossil system uh, assemble half, half of their mass, and then at any redshift, the, uh, the assembling is higher in fossil group than in non-fossil group. Yes. What is a fossil group? It's this one. It's a system where all the galaxies have collapsed onto the BCG, mm -hmm. and what we have left is the X-ray halo that is still luminous because given that we have an active uh, galaxy in the center, the AGN feedback reheats and re-energizes the particle in the ICM, and this is why the hot X-ray halo is still, uh, is still visible. The growth of the BCG at um, redshift around one is due to major mergers. So with the, um, with the data we had in the X-ray, uh, I measured the cooling time for this source that is longer than one giga years, while galaxy mergers is usually one giga year. So it's reasonable to think that this uh, AGN feedback is, act, um, is uh, actively affecting this uh, fossil group. This is the summary. So I studied both in the optical, optical and X-ray, the high redshift quasar 3C297. I did the spectral analysis of the core, finding that it might be absorbed. This is reasonable if you are looking at the merging system. Uh, I found uh, uh, extended emission, of course, but I could not constrain the temperature. From the field spectroscopy with the um, uh, Gemini multi, multi slit, uh, I found the new redshift for 3C297 and no sources at the same redshift. Then a detection of power outflow from the IGN, and we made the hypothesis of a fossil group. So, just to summarize, I presented a multi wavelength approach to the radio loud AGN phenomenon. I showed that radio infrared optical and X ray are very useful to better characterize all the sources, in particular the unknown sources. The idea would be to do another uh, X-ray follow-up for the sources for which we found uh, a higher uh, intrinsic absorption in the core. And also since all have uh, um, infrared counterpart to use better the infrared uh, observation. Then I found uh, possible sunayet zeldovich effect in the giant radio galaxy 3C403.1. So the idea would be to observe with the SRT that now is back, in, uh, back at work, other giant radio galaxies, maybe uh, close to us as uh, 3C403, and to complement this with the low radio frequency observation. And finally, I did an X-ray and optical study of a high-reshift radio loud quasar. 
uh, the idea would be to search for a other high redshift fossil group with the same uh, condition and also to perform a low radio frequency follow up to better um, uh, reconstruct the emission from the counter jet and to see uh, if it's possible to understand how much the jet uh, has a contribution in the extended emission that we see in the X-ray. And thank you. Thank you very much, Ale. Thank you. Um, any questions from here? In the yes. In the first part, where you showed, you said you had no optical counterpart. Yes. Yes. How did these are areas that fans start image and there was no? What is the how far away do the sources need to be in order for you not to see them in the optical? Like well, they could also be very nearby, but heavily obscured. In, see at all the elliptical? Yes, yes, my happen, yes. But the obscuration is very, you know, if it's nearby... You, you mean it's the obscuration right? of the AGN yeah, itself? So you have a completely obscured source. You maybe have some, something which is very far away. Well, so not very far away as, because, for example, this is uh, okay. This is not very reliable. But so you think that these are redshift three or four? That's no. I would say it's redshift around one. But again, I cannot yeah. state this for sure. But exactly the person who analyzed it means equation. No, no, I'm done. It's just I'm just surprised that uh, you know what is the depth of the optical survey. Uh, I think Pastas can reach up to 24 magnitudes, something like this. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have the related equation about yes, 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 yes. Source, but I think that you mentioned that you have X ray data. Yes, yes. Did you, These are X ray exactly, data. Did you, did you try to perform spectral field of the nucleus? Yes. Yes, I, yes, I, yes, I did. The other source, if, because I think that you. You left out some sources with uh, missing optical counterparts. Yes, case. because I didn't have enough counts to do the uh, um, ah. X-ray spectral analysis. For all the sources that had enough X-ray counts in the core, I did the spectral analysis and I ob uh, obtained um, um, intrinsic absorption around 10 to the 23. So the idea would be to do an hard X-ray follow-up for these sources. And maybe for the one that lack an optical counterpart, deeper Chandra observation to see if we can um, like uh, have enough counts to do the spectral analysis. Uh, I just a bit, I'm a bit confused because you showed us at the beginning that this uh, result has been published in two different uh, papers that are kind of divided by the resident actions. Uh, no, you mean? Um, no, 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 no. Ah. No, the paper by Maselli just reported the. Uh, um, X-ray detection with, with no 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 this too is just to uh, introduce the snapshot survey of Chandra that we did for all the sources with optical counterpart all the sources up to redshift two uh -huh. and uh, it was the, of course it was divided by redshift because uh, of the exposure of the observation. Okay, but it's okay. So for some of them, we don't have the ratio information. The for this, yes. For this too, but the, the, the these are the, the no. The for this, no. The only redshift I have is the photometric redshift that I showed that is computed through the Globaki code mm -hmm. that use the magnitude in the infrared. If I may add, so the idea of the snapshot survey, which Chandra was first to take all the sources with no redshift and divide them in bins of redshift and uh, uh, image them, observe them with Chandra with uh, increasing exposure with increasing uh, uh, redshift. Then for the other sources without the redshift, without optical, then a separate proposal were performed with a tentative exposure yes, of, I don't know, yes. uh, 
I don't remember 12 or 14 kilos egg. Yes. And uh, the, the, especially for the one that were unidentified uh, in the tree. Yes. So the, the final goal would be to complete the X ray coverage of the tree okay. sample with all the sort of 300 species. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, at some point, you mentioned something about the AIDS. Ah, yes, for the radio. <laughs> well, How did you the uh, there is a relation. If you use the equipartition field and others val other values, you can estimate the age of the source. It's just an equation. This is the age of the AIDS. Yes. How long is it, is it I think it's yeah, active, yes. Yes. Related to this, like, yes, I didn't understand what is the break frequency of uh, the break frequency uh, for this, uh, like, feed here can be used uh, as the clock to see when the first population of a of uh, electrons was ejected from the uh, from the AGN. Because if we could see the time evolution of this uh, curve here we should observe that the break frequency moves to lower frequencies because more time has passed from the first ejection. Mm -hmm. No, okay, then thanks for the other.